Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, Episode 50, Part 1, with Harry Watling and Michael Beale. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show and uh, well this is the 50th show. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, going to split this into two, so we've got part one and part two. So I uh, just first want to say look, thanks very much for all the support uh, over the last episodes. Uh, remember if you like it, do leave a review, but I'm really honoured and like privileged to feel that you guys have stuck around for uh, 50 shows. Uh, it's really momentous. Uh, this really started off as a way for me to you know, uh, grow my knowledge and speak to some of the... Uh, the best player developers around the world and uh, I'm proud to say that um, I've got some of the best ones here as well for this two-part special um, so uh, starting off this one here to someone uh, this one's a special so I've got two guests in this first one first person's uh, Michael Beale someone who's had a massive impact impact on my career the main reason I went to Chelsea and obviously that's been a huge factor in my development as well uh, he's one of the best player developers around he's worked really from you know five roles all the way to the first team Obviously, a long career at Chelsea, really uh, integral in, in setting up as being one of the best academies in world football. Uh, you know, went to Liverpool, uh, went to Brazil, and now obviously first team coach at Rangers, and and really is one of the best around. And uh, it's a really uh, privilege that he's you know uh, not only come on the show, but I can call him a friend as well. And so uh, he really has uh, lots of. Uh, goal to, to share as always and then also we've also got Harry Watling Harry also someone I work with at Chelsea he really is one of the rising stars of uh, academy football and uh, really uh, could work at whatever level he wants to really is top top coach uh, he's worked at Chelsea like I said Millwall and and now West Ham and he's a class act and also a friend of mine uh, so really privileged these guys could come on the show and, uh, and share the knowledge we had a few questions uh, from social media uh, which was great uh, but yeah again just want to say thanks very much um, for all your support over this one like I said this is a two part show look this is a difficult time we're living in um, so we've just got to look, be positive and look for the future um, my personal support coach at the moment is supporting clubs all over the world like I said we've got a 70% off uh, discount special on our club partnership at the moment we're just trying to help as many clubs out around the world as possible so just try and do it as close to cost as possible so if you're interested how we, uh, my personal football coach can help your coach your club around the world wherever you are to give your players and coaches some remote learning opportunities just uh, drop me a DM uh, we've had clubs sign up from literally all around the world North America Australia Asia England Europe so um, listen it's really exciting to support as many clubs as possible during this hard time but like I said uh, a 70% discount to try and support as many clubs as possible so just drop me a DM like I said this is a part two parter so this is part one this is a cracker and then uh, part two is coming up as well with another person who's probably the one of the biggest if not the biggest uh, influence in my career as well so uh, stay tuned guys and stay safe so Michael Beale and Harry Watlin welcome to the show thanks for having us on so mate it's a pleasure to, to come and chat thanks man so guys, uh, listen. We've had a few questions um, from some of the some of the people out there. We said we're going to just have a little bit of discussion about youth developments. So There's a couple of questions first. So um, one first one is uh, so guys, uh, how do you implement individual development in uh, under nines and under twelves? That one's was to Harry. So Harry, you go first, and then Mickey can go second. How do you uh, implement individual development for U nines to U twelves? Think. I think it's all around planning that one, so so if you're just talking about implementing it within your sessions, I think when you plan your session, you're highlighting those particular players that you that you, that you're gonna really target within that that theme or that practice. I think each player will have an individual development plan anyway, so you'll always be speaking to them in and around the session during the session about things that they can do to enhance their strengths and test their self and try and brush their weaknesses up. But for me, it would just it would be really around planning it, having open discussions, keeping the discussions open in terms of if they're reaching targets, brilliant, setting new ones, and if they're not trying to trying to get them there with with what you're doing, but also stuff outside what they can control as well within their extras. 
Mickey? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think like in your club, like you have to have an idea in your club or that doesn't matter if it's grassroots or if it's like it's an academy. You have to have an idea of what you, how you're going to arrive at the big pitch. So from sort of anything pre-12, it's like what do you want your under-12 to look like when they get to the big pitch? So what what techniques do you, do you desire them having? So for me, like what's really fundamental is the ability to receive, move and release the ball. And then that's a really individual thing. And there should be like, your coaching in these age groups should be about the player and their relationship with the ball. And then once they have that relationship with the ball and it's it's about them, then it, when every time they share it with someone else or they lend it, it should be about getting it back. So you should only really be focusing on the individual player plus one or two more to, to, to have a relationship on the pitch. But the big things for me in talking about individual development 9 to 12 is everything head to toe, right to left. So it's when they get to under 12, it's what's stuck. So I would call that the hard drive phase. So it's like the hard drive techniques so all the things that are going to be in their game before you start adding decision making. And then the other big thing that I think all three of us are passionate about is the ability to outplay 1v1. So I think the 9s to 12s or whatever, however far you want to go, it's very individual anyway. The, all of your training should be individual. It should be focused on that I suppose, player and their relationship. I, I suppose then the, the question is, what does that look like? So, for instance, what does that look like in an under nine session? What would your typical under nine session look like if you're working on individual stuff? And then again, under 12, what do you reckon, Mickey, about that? And what's your typical under nine session look like? I would say that there's a lot of, lot of contact time with the ball. So, you know, it really frustrates me now that like I've got two young boys that are, are, are playing in that age group. So I go and watch their coaches and I sit back and, and just watch. It frustrates me when I see all them balls in the bag. So, you know, them balls should be out. Each player should have one. And I don't think you always need to be the person instructing with the eyes on them. So you can set a skill or a twist or a turn for the group. You don't always have to have your eyes on people. There's a certain element of just being with the ball and having that relationship with it where it will work with just repetition, the players will find that smooth movement without you necessarily having to break it down. So I think that there's an art to coaching in that age group. I think it's a lot of contact time with the ball. It's a lot of small-sided opposed stuff. So your 2v2s, your 3v3s, messing around with the size of the pitch as well because um, you've got your runners. And if you don't play in big areas, how do your runners ever come to the fore? So deal with space deal with people arriving at different sides of you. So there's, there's a huge impact. And I, I don't think the under-9 session and the under-12 is too different. I think it's very, very similar in how it would run. It's just in what you demand from the players um, and the intensity. So I don't actually think the practices are too different. That was how I run it when I was head of coaching at Liverpool in the foundation phase. And I didn't change too much for the work I'd done at Chelsea two, 10 years prior, uh, prior to that. About you, H, what's your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, what's a typical under nine session going to be looking like to get those individual outcomes out? No, I think you mix it the nail on the end. I think they have to have the ball. I think we can, as coaches, we can worry about the detail behind the scenes and we can be really deliberate in how we set things out to get certain outcomes. But I also think the word play is, is not used enough. The kid, they need to play. They have to play. So ball rolling time is really important. Um, just something that Mick touched on in regards to just allowing them to to be playing. You're not having to, you know, extensively coach it, but you're just looking for them to have loads and loads of tries at things. I think he's really important. Um, I think his point about changing the size of the pitch, adding different decisions, um, and just probably speak about it a little bit later, but I think you want all your footballers to be able to think in the future. So if you're giving them certain decisions to make, whether it's to use a friend or whether it's to use a ball or whether it's to use a different type of goal and end zone gates, you want them to think in the future. But the word, the word play for me is a massive, a massive part of being in and around that phase. And and I mean, both of you have alluded to that though. But then, how do we you balance the the game on Sunday? For for instance, you're under 12s, under going into 11 side football. Now, how how do you how how much time do you spend on that team stuff in terms of your your possession, your group possession, and you're transitioning to that. And obviously, you know, where, where, how do you balance those two things? I'll, I'll, I'll just my, my whole feeling on football, with like in terms of like of tactics. Obviously, I work at first team level now, where tactics are important. And you know, we've had some big games this year where tactics have been so important in terms of control and space and things like that. But 
when you really, really break it down, it's much more about the positional small-sided games than it is 11 v 11. 11 v 11 is like when you walk out the tunnel. When the game starts, in that 20 yards around the ball, it's about them little small positional games. So if a team play one striker and you're playing out from the back with two centre-halves and the goalie, how do you manage the 3v1? How do you manage a centre-half dribbling through the pitch and he's coming into midfield, which is 3v3? How do people open for him? How do they get their shoulders open? How do you play off your right hand, your left hand? What techniques do you need? So I think the small side of games all link to the big game. I think the coaches that start looking at the collective too soon, and I think under-12s again is too soon, they're going to make so many mistakes. You know, it's, it, it should be like a step-by-step process. And, you know, I think when you become a father as well, I do think you become a better coach because you start seeing really firsthand every day how children learn and take on information. And I think that as football coaches, we have to be very, very clever in our planning, like Harry said, pre-planning, and then watering down all of that um, idea you have about football into the most simple terms. And I, I still think the best tactic in football is the ability to outplay the player in front of you and the ability to think in 2v1. So if I can't get past you, Saul, because you're bigger and stronger than me, how do I play a 1-2 to get past you? How do I use someone else's movement and maybe a a disguise to pass to get past you? How do I pass uh, and make a step to make a second angle to receive again? So for me, football, the best tactic is out playing 1v1 and then linking it to the second player. And that was something we worked at at Liverpool in the foundation age groups there for a good period of time and we had fantastic success with that it's interesting though isn't it I mean you mentioned there I know Harry as well is a big fan of the 1v1 why do you think there's still it still hasn't really caught uh, a grip to English academy football I mean it's getting more prevalent but still there you know you look at the courses coming down there's still not that emphasis on 1v1 why do you think that is H or H go on Mickey We've, we've, well, I'll just say like you know Alex Singapore had a great way of uh, Liverpool it was a great saying really he was like well, the under nine should be really messy and I'm going to like judge it on wow moments. And the under 10 should be a little bit less messy, but it's still about wow moments. And when you get up to the 18s, the 18s has got to be messier than the reserves. The reserves has got to be messier than the first team because it, it's this big thing about um, playfulness and expression. And so we've got to be careful that we don't coach all the time. We've got to be careful that I'm an under 12 coach at whatever club in an academy and because I want to be the under-14s coach and the 16s coach, I don't make my team look like mini Barcelona. We have to be very, very careful of that. You know, I see a lot of coaches talking about positional play. Well, the reason someone like Barcelona play positional play is it's very hard to stop the person on the right wing and the person on the left wing and the person in the middle. But then when you get the ball to them, they can play 1v1. I see a lot of coaches talking about positional play with under-13s, 14s they got boys who can't receive the ball on their back foot on both sides yet. So there's a there's a process towards it. And I'd say Alex Singlethorpe's being there of like being messy in the younger age groups, I think is really important. And normally there's not enough role models in youth development coaching. There is. If you're a first team coach, you watch Guardiola or Mourinho or Klopp, you know, but in youth development, where's the role models in terms of pushing this enough in terms of the individual development? And I think when coaches get to the top end, it's important that they send that message back down. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Alex there. Obviously, Alex worked with me working under with Chris and obviously John at Spurs where 1v1 was a massive part of it and it's quite unique. It's still quite unique to them now. So maybe, you know, there's the offsprings of that, that you know, working under John McDermott and, and Chris Ramsey, who are big advocates. There are, there are some of those uh, role models who, you know, who really prescribe this sort of work, but maybe not enough. H, wait, H what's your thoughts on on that in terms of why maybe 1v1 it really hasn't taken a grip of, of uh, academy football yet I think, um, I think there's a few things that we need to really sort of hammer home I think the first thing is it might sound a little bit robust and controversial but two, the two most prominent jobs I've had are probably under 9s and under 12s and the reason why I say that is because my message to the coaches out there is don't try and prepare your under nine for first team football. Just get them ready for the next phase of their young career. So what do they need to get out of the foundation phase and be prepared for the next phase? So when I was when I was a under 12s coach at Millwall, um, some of the guys in the foundation would, would be, and again, Mick spot on, under 11s coaches talking about, you know, patterns of play and it drive, drive you mad. Just 
get them ready so they're technically competent and, and ready to take on the next amount of information for the next level. So that, that would be the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, on the role model thing is, I don't think there are enough coaches that are, I think there's three things to this song. Number one, you've got to know yourself as a coach. The second thing, you've got to know your players. And the third thing, you've got to know your role. If you know yourself as a coach and you say, I want to be an expert under nines coach, or I want to be the best under tens coach in England. Okay, brilliant. So now you know where you belong. What does it take for you to be the best under tens coach in England? The next thing is knowing your players. What do they need at what time? An under 10 does not need to, does not need to know five corner routines. He doesn't need to know, uh, you know, if, if, a, if a number nine drops in, where do I go? He doesn't need to know that. He needs to be able to deal with the ball, handle the ball in extreme situations under extreme pressure from, like Mick said, physicality, but also maybe people that are more intelligent, maybe people that are more vocal so they gain a friend over to create a 1v2. The other thing is your role. So the role of being a top, top level coach at that particular age group, you have to know what that means and what that takes and what the trend is for players coming through, what they're going to look like, what will they need to look like later on. And then finally, just to answer your, your initial question on role models, I don't think there's enough coaches out there that have embraced that initially and said, I'm an under 10s coach. I've been an under 10s coach for five years and I want to be an under 10s coach for the next five years and I want to be brilliant at it. And this is why dominating a 1v1 is so important so that player, uh, so that coaches later on down the line can use their terminology and the kids can understand it and it doesn't frighten them and they don't get confused. And, and I think if we do that, we'll produce better footballers. Uh, um, and what's yeah. Go on, mate. Go on, Mickey. Yeah. Sorry, like, this is a really important subject. Like For me, if it's a nine-year-old player, they've probably been playing for four years. So they're a four-year-old football player. So you wouldn't go to a restaurant and give a four-year-old football player... Or, you wouldn't go to a restaurant and give a four-year-old a free-course meal, would you? So you have to break it down to what they need at that time. And the other thing is, what do you want at the end? So when I was an under-23s coach, we had an idea that, come on, we'll take the nines and tens coach to be with us for three or four days to sit in the dugout when we're playing the under-23s game and listen to why, listen to the frustrations of the coaches. And most of it was technical um, deficiencies, why the ball was turned over, why we didn't score, why we couldn't play from the back or whatnot. So what do you want at the end in terms of technique, in terms of the ability to play off both sides, in terms of the ability to, the awareness on the pitch, decision-making? What do you want at the end? And then you have to, you have to think about it and it has to be a build-up and a step process. And I think that, people's own desires and careers get in the way of player development. And that's something that coaches really need to think, of, think and, about. Are what, you really work like What do you think yourself? about the, the, uh, the current climate, though? I mean, look at with the way a lot of the modern youth games going with, you know, games-based approach. Is it, you know, a lot of academies aren't doing anything apart from games. Uh, you know, do you think there's a, there's a danger that young players potentially missing out technically uh, long, uh, down the line? H, you reckon? I think, yeah, I, I do think there's, there's the potential for that, and I, I, I just think we're, you know, we're brushing over similar things with what all three of us are saying in regards to the fact that I don't think it's appreciated enough. I think um, adult football obviously gets a lot of exposure, and teams that are lauded, I think it probably started off, you know, with with Pep's Barcelona of playing one and two touch ticky tack of football, and everyone probably being misled by that thinking that's the way for everybody to be what you have to understand is and we've I think we've all repeated it already is in order to play a style like that you have to be able to be competent in order to do it first when he went to Man City he had players in his squad that wasn't able to do that and he got rid of them now wouldn't it be brilliant if he'd have gone to gone and taken over a squad where he had players that were able to adapt take the ball take on the man do exactly what he wanted I just think we need to strip it back, as we've all said again, strip it back. What do they need at that particular time? And don't don't overcook it. And just under, if I do, I do genuinely think if a coach understands where they belong and what their speciality is. I mean, as an example, so if you go out to Holland and you speak to the guys out in Holland, if you tell them you're an under nines coach, they think it's the best job in football. You speak to them and they say, "Wow, it's a really important role." In England, we see it as like the first step on the ladder 
to becoming the next Jose Mourinho, which is I think is wrong. And we've all listen, we've all been guilty of it, myself included, trying to climb too early and being too eager. And Mick's always said to me, "Stay cool, calm down. You'll find you'll find where you belong." And I think it's important for coaches to understand at some point. You know, this is where I belong, and this is what the players need, and they really need to really need to embrace that. I mean, that's a great point. But what I'm saying is that, do you think you know, you know, because obviously, do you think there's a lack of balance sometimes? What I'm trying to say. So we always, we want free play, like you mentioned. We want small sided games that you mentioned, Mickey. But then have we gone too far the, over the other way, where it's just all games. It's a bit laissez-faire. It's a bit late. Stand back. Let them get on with it. Players will develop things, but are we, especially in an elite environment, missing the opportunity to really stretch players and you know develop them in those one v one and those technical areas with our with a bit more of a stand back approach? Mickey, what do you think of that? I think it's really important. Like I think there's, there's two things, mate. We've got children that are not playing out no more, so they're only training when they're with us. So there has to be this element of playfulness. There needs to be this part of rehearsal as well. So like you know this thing about you and your relationship with you and the ball, like. When we all started playing football, when we were young, you were able to play out more. And it's, it's a big pride to be able to do certain things with football. So whether you can juggle a certain amount or you have a different skill or the way you control the ball or the way that like someone like Beckham or Gerrard strike the ball, you know, that's a real pride. And when I went to Brazil, I noticed that. All techniques almost are given. You're not allowed on the pitch if you don't have techniques. So this relationship between you and the ball is pretty much sacred. And that's the foundation of football for me. You have a relationship with the ball, then you have a relationship with the game, and then lastly, relationship with the club. So academies need to think less about making the kid attached to the club, more with the ball and the game and the, and the staff that work with them. I, I think playfulness and the ability to not have coaches always on top of you while you are playing. This saying about training how you play as well, it really worries me because you'll only then play how you played last week. You should always train to improve. And I think training's very, very individual, even at first team level. You train for yourself Monday to Friday, you play for the team on Saturday. And what I mean by that is, if there's something you're unsure of last week, ask the question. If you need to improve something in the gym, improve it. If you need to improve something technically, improve it. If you need to eat better or sleep better. So you take that back to little kids. If we don't give them this exposure to them and the ball, and then adding in the second player, then adding in the third player. So it's a step-by-step process, how they learn at school, how they learn just as young people. Then we're coaching something completely different. And the other point on that is we should never coach mini soccer. We should just coach football. So in the big game, there is 2v1s. In the big game, there is 1v1s. You might have to switch a ball quickly to get a 1v1. To get a 2v1, you might have to run beyond the ball. To, to make a 3v3, 4v3, you might have to have someone bringing the ball forward and everyone open, expanding. So I, I was big thing with that when I was doing the head of coaching at, at Liverpool there with the younger coaches was do not coach mini soccer. I don't want to see us playing 7v7 playing out from the back. If we're playing, let's play and then just coach what you see within the game. But these boys, they, they have to get better as individuals. Teams don't learn. It's a great quote from Johan Cruyff. Teams don't learn individuals learn and it's so true interesting it's quality cheers Mickey so just hit that, that leads us quite nicely onto the next question about <clears throat> about technique but there's another question here it says Henri had a coach at Claire Fontaine that told him he couldn't use speed in games and, and Kobe Bryant said that when playing in summer tournaments he only used his weaknesses what are your thoughts on getting players to use their weaknesses instead of their strengths H you want to go first with that one um, okay so just to address the point straight away it's uh, I think what makes what makes you different, Saul, what makes Mickey different, what makes, makes me different is what, what I'm good at. So you cannot ignore your strengths. I think it's so important that when, when you're talking to players of a young age and they're coming through, that they're really aware of why they're there and what they're good at. Um, what I would say is I can give you some applied examples of what I've done with under 13s, under 14s, under 15 players. In regards to that, um, I think I've mentioned this before, but... I, 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 I had a lad I, I thought had huge potential um, I thought he passed the ball too early um, outstanding mover really good receiving and releasing skills but didn't really ever travel with the ball and it was just, that was more of a choice because he'd never really done it so I put some framework around him during the games uh, in, within the games programme and there were certain periods in the games where when he received it in the midfield third he wasn't allowed to pass the ball at all so he had to travel with it and drive um, and listen, some of it was a little bit messy, um, as Mick would use that terminology, messy. But 
it was really good and it worked out really well. There's, there's things that I've done with players uh, about their finishing and you know what areas of the goal that they really enjoy finishing in and to really concentrate on that so they know what type of goal scorer they are, whether they're you know whether they're really good at attacking crosses or whether they're really good at receiving through balls in behind. Um, you may have players that are early physical developers, so they just run behind all the time. So it's also important to make them conscious that, OK, when it evens out, even though that may still be your super strength, you may have to hold and link. You may have to move twice to lose your man first just to create good habits. So to go back to the original point, I, I do think it's really important to... We don't want to round everyone off. So every single player that we produce is a clone of the other one and they're all six out of 10 at everything and nine out of 10 at nothing. We need to make sure that that eight out of 10 is refined and improved to a nine, a nine and a half. And maybe the three or four out of 10, we can try and round off to a six so they can be competent and still handle it. Does that make sense? Yeah, fantastic. And what about you, Mickey? I'll answer both both them things there so like in terms of Kobe Bryant you know when you're working on something it's obviously a process of improvement so therefore with Kobe Bryant he's using a game there for training he's not using a game to test he's full he's full um, performance he's using that game for training so what I would throw back is like when do we do that in academies then if we see each game as a test of how we're doing or do we see it as training for me personally, again, I see training in the in academy games. I see, sorry, matches as training. That's an extension of training. So uh, that's how I would uh, question the or or answer to the Kobe Bryant thing. I think that's a fantastic insight into him. He was using a lower level game, less important game, to practice on uh, in areas that he wanted to. And then secondly, in terms of Henri, I echo what Harry says. I always try to make a player understand what they're good at. And I tried to use that as a bit of self-being, self-worth, self-awareness. And from that, I would say, how do you make a strength a super strength? So Thierry Henry is a goal scorer. So what type of goals do you score? You have to keep practicing that. But what type of chances are you not scoring? So how do you make your super strength of goal scoring? How do you make your strength a super strength, should I say? So what goals are you scoring? You've got to keep scoring them. But you need to score more on your left foot, your head in, more scruffy goals, more outside the box and link it all to what your strength is, goal scoring. And in, in that comment there, you don't, you know, when someone makes a comment, you don't know the context of it. But if I believe it like this, when Thierry Henry had space to run in, he was fantastic. So if he's playing away at Anfield, for example, and Liverpool are forced to defend the halfway line because that's what Liverpool fans demand, then he has a half a pitch to run into. So what Thierry Henry would have had to learn and as he got older and any player with pace is what happens when you play at home and the other team sit on the edge of the box? Now your pace is nullified to a certain extent. So how do you then uh, use that super strength? Is it volume of movement? Is it range of movement? Is it disguise movements? Is it combination play? So I think the big thing in, in the question is it's not working on weaknesses it's rounding off your strengths your super strengths and, and, and Mick, Michael just uh, quickly mate I mean it's interesting because obviously now you work first team level what, it interests me there I mean because obviously you worked all the way through the whole cycle development cycle in our first team what do you, how do you deal with a player maybe that has a weakness so you know it's, I mean I imagine the first team environment is a lot is a lot you know less forgiving than obviously when you're in the 23s you know when you can say okay well just go and work with this I mean do you have time to come and develop players still work with them and try and support them or is it pretty much okay well if he can't do it let's find someone can no there's obviously there's a process and there's a certain amount of time I'm a developer and I take the word youth off of development you're not a youth developer you're a developer and I think that at this any age group I've found that most talented players I work with at first team level are so eager to to develop that you have to almost you're keeping up with them because they're urging you every day so you can split your staff to make things more personal so you can have certain members of staff to look after certain players I think a discussion is really important in terms of where do they see themselves what's their identity I think in terms of your your work on the pitch the thing that's different with 13 players than working in the academy is when you're an under 18s coach or 16 or whatever age group all the way through, and if you if, if you're quite powerful as a coach, because if you say to a young player you're going to need to work on that, otherwise you might not get there. There's always that fear in the player's mind they might not get there. So there's a sort of buy-in just based on that that relationship that then or that fact that they're not a first team player, and that's their dream. So there's a bit of buy-in when you get to first team. You're working with millionaires, and now it comes down to the desire of the player. 
the player might already have the big house, the big car, the fantastic salary, he might be an international, and you come along and you're saying, look, to get the 1%, 2%, 3% gain, I think you need to add this to your game. You have to then, the way that you get buy-in then, you have to be really, really creative, I think. And you you have to, you have, you're dealing with a man, you're not dealing with a kid. So there'll be a lot of why and a lot of, there might be a little bit of restriction as well. But I think the big thing for all players is knowing what their identity is, knowing what they are at their best. And then what do you do every day to maintain it? I think a lot of things about you know improving, I think the best players maintain and then enhance what they're already good at. And it is, it's a fascinating process. You know, I find first team football a lot less personal than academy football. I think it, it all, I would, my advice to coaches trying to get to first team is be careful, get there when the time's right because the the personal relationships you have now in the academy and the journey you're on with kids is, is amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think I, I work uh, work with a, a first team uh, what for player the other, last year and he's uh, obviously plays out wide uh, so one of the super strength was crossing so every session before every session he used to do 50 crosses with his left 50 crosses with his right just like you say you know that's what I'm probably going to get judged on especially at the highest level that's just your your super skill to, to try and maintain it and make it better I do think as well so like we have to be not harsh on young kids but we need to open their eyes up before they get to the first team because you don't want to be practicing something you know, at Wembley in front of a packed house. That's not where you want to be learning and practicing. You want to have done the practice beforehand. And I think first team um, environments, as you say, are very unforgiving. So when you get to the first team, you must have ownership of your own development. Like you say there, it's fantastic to hear that that young player at Watford, whoever his youth coaches were, were obviously excellent because he's now got a ritual that he stands by. That's his daily ritual of going out. And that's his maintenance. That's his maintenance of his core techniques, his core attributes in his game you know that's the first line on his job description is to obviously serve his centre forward so it, that that's really important he's got that if you wait for the coaches and I see it all the time you know I see it at first team level at the last two clubs that I've been at there's not enough players like that I'm hoping the next generation are take much more ownership in their own careers and they're not just waiting for their coaches so for coaches that are working in academies now you know, it's, it's a it's, you have to you have to affect mindsets and mentality as much as you do their football ability on the pitch. I think. Fantastic. Okay, there's another question. So going back down towards the younger age groups, how important is juggling for young players in the foundation phase? Is it practices in European academies? Any coaching tips to improve it, please? Those ones to UH first. Juggling is important. Probably undervalued. I think, you know, it's all around your first touch and thinking, again, I said this earlier, about thinking in the future. So if I'm going to use my laces, where do I want to leave it for my next touch? Do I want to go higher? Do I want to leave it soft for my other foot? Do I want to change the angle? Do I want to address a different part of the ball? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's undervalued. I think it needs to be it needs to be used more and introduced to the players um, as, part of, as part of maybe an introduction to each session, part of the ball familiarity, bits at the beginning. Um, to increase their, you know, increase ball rolling, to increase their touches. Mickey, what do you reckon? Yeah, it comes back to that thing about, you know, relationship with the ball. You remember being a kid yourself and you was always trying to beat your score, wasn't you? Do you know what I mean? I don't see that enough now in kids. I think also, like, your core balance from right to left, how you carry your body as well, I think it's important. And, you know, I've got this thing where, in, in you know, if you think of your foot, there's eight surfaces as you go around your foot. And uh, um, so on both feet, there's 16 surfaces. So there's the toe, your laces, your inside to curl, your outside to curl, your instep, your sole, your heel. And so I think just teaching players when you're doing ball manipulation exercises how to use all them areas. And also when you're doing kick-ups, just to receive the ball and have your first touch on different areas. I think that juggling comes back to what I really believe that the start of football should be about you and the ball. So, yeah, I'm an advocate of, of juggling and then... And I think challenges. We used to have the Maradona challenge when we were kids, didn't we? That was the, that was the yeah. craze back then. Remember the old warm up where he's going up one side of his body and down the other. And again, whatever gets kids practicing, I'm all for. And obviously, whatever gets kids working in isolation with themselves and the ball away from training. And I think juggling is a great way to do that. I would advise coaches to always have a little homework thing at the end of the session because what that does is it makes kids competitive to come back. It makes it challenges them. And also what you, you're influencing is when they're not with you, because they will practice. 
My, my thing about this is that jogging is really important, isn't it? But my, what gets me is when people say, yeah, we do ball mastery and they say, right, cut, you know, five minutes of kick-ups at the beginning of the session, there's your ball mastery. I think that's where you know, we, a lot of times, especially in this country, we fall down a bit, maybe not utilising that time, like you say, with the ball, you know, especially at the beginning of the session or whenever in the session, you know, I think it can be a, a bit of a cop-out for some people. Yeah, I think like this big thing, like, I, I, I try and break it down. Hard drive techniques, ability to outplay. And what I mean by hard drive techniques is how do you receive, how do you move, how do you release? So moving like dribbling, running with the ball. How do you receive it? Well, where's the ball? Is it on the floor? Is it on the air? Do you receive to take the ball away away from someone? Do you receive to protect? Do you receive to control? Uh, do you receive to turn? So all these little things you link. And uh, that's for me, receiving, moving, releasing. Just, just, just keep linking that and connecting them things and, that's each player's own hard drive. Now, you keep putting that in every day, it will come out. And then you can manage limitations later on. But there's this is a big thing. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're working at Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea, or you're working at grassroots. Surely we all teach young boys the same, how to play football at, as well as possible. Surely we don't have some people saying, well, you're not, you know, you're playing for grassroots, you know, Kenza and FC. You know, you're not the bike boy at Chelsea, so you just kick it forward. Surely we don't do that with nine, ten-year-olds. Surely everyone's given the same opportunity to grow and develop because you can all play at different levels. You know, you all play well. It's just at what level you can play at. And, and I think that's so important that football in the foundation phase should, seem, should be seen really as the individual work. I, I believe that all the way through, as I said. But, but I definitely think at the, the base, it's just about the player on the ball. Yeah, but you all know that all clubs have different ways of doing things, don't we? You know, especially in London, there's a lot of different ways to, to uh, you know, to do that, and there's a lot of diversity. H, what do you reckon? Just, just on that, just on that point as well. I think, I think Mick's hit the nail on the head in regards to. I think with these, I think these podcasts that you do are brilliant. I think sometimes we lose, we lose a little bit of reality in in regards to people may tune in and not be able to relate to some of the people that they're listening to because. Just as an example, we're listening to Michael Gu, who works with Rangers first team, but the fact that he's just made a statement like that, that it doesn't change and it shouldn't change, whether you're working at a grassroots team or somewhere else, it shouldn't change. I think the word, I don't want to ramble on, I think the word is detail. I think you've got to take real care in what you're teaching the kid. I think it's detail. I think, like you said, don't just give them a ball and say first of 100 and, and, and walk off. It's got to be, you know, there's got to be a thought process talking about the different surfaces of the feet, challenging them, pitting them against each other 1v1 in, in, in either a technical challenge or maybe an opposed challenge. But we have to think about those things. I remember when I got my first job in the development centre at Chelsea and my, my gig, my job that week, every week, was to pick up everyone's cones. But for the first 20 minutes of the session, I was on ball mastery. That was the most important 20 minutes of my week and the kids' week. In my eyes, I was thinking to myself, I need to make this absolutely spot on 10 out of 10 for these kids. I need to go. I need to have detail within my thought process, but make it simplistic for them, but get the outcomes. And I think that if we can just hammer that home as well, that everyone listening to this, whether you're working in England, Europe, the, the States, South America, we, we have to relate this back to the people that are listening as well and not get lost in in some of the other stuff I think that's important but yeah I still think that there's still you know there's still uh, limited in terms of the treating the foundation phase is different to the YDP do you know what I mean there's not enough you know foundation specialists or in terms of you know tr that is completely different to what that looks like so I mean Mickey obviously you you had that role at Liverpool when you focused on the foundation phase and led the coaches of that and very much like a specialist in the area and you've worked across all do you think we maybe need for example, heads of coaching for foundation phase across clubs. I know Wolves used to have one. You did that role at Liverpool. Do you think that would be a good way to go? Yeah, for me, it was like the best year. Like, this is incredible, this this point that I'm going to make now. People won't believe it. It's the best year I had in football. That year, I went back to Liverpool. It's the best year I had. I'd just been up to first-team football. I enjoyed it. Obviously, my experience in Brazil was fantastic. I came home with so much energy for youth development, you wouldn't believe. And, and I wanted to sit, share a little bit of what I see in Brazil. And just having the time away from English academies gave me a, a lot of clarity as well. And, uh, yeah, that was the best year because I was able to use a lot of the experiences of being an older coach and why players were failing. The worst thing in football is when you tell a player he's not good enough at this moment in time to stay at the club. 
And you always say it to women that way as well. You're not good enough at this moment in time at this club to progress because if you don't say it in that way, you can get really fan out. And But the point I'm making is you get to under 16, you sit in a room and tell a player you ain't going to be a scholar. It's the hardest job in the world. The boy's crying, the parents are probably crying or they're, they're about to leave the room and cry. You're really upset. It's the most stressful mental thing. You've probably been on a journey with a player. So you've got to be careful if you're sat in that room that you haven't played a big part in why you're not giving that kid a scholarship. If you've done everything you can, so that's what I mean. If you can use that, why are boys failing? Why are boys not making it? Why are boys we bringing in players from overseas to go in the place of our players? If you can know that because you've been on that journey, then I think you can really help the foundation, folks. The other thing I want to put across here is, so you're not talking about circus acts. And I think this needs to be, you know, given clarity. We're not talking about players who are doing 57 step overs. We're not talking about that. That's not individual and that's not ball mastery. We're talking about the, the ability to receive it, to move with it, to throw a fake, to outplay someone or to link with one or two players and link in this awareness of one or two players that are close to you and how to use them as part of ball mastery, as part of being clever on the pitch. And again, when you get to first team level, and this is why I think it's about individuals. If you're putting on a session tactical, you're playing in Europe like we played this year against Porto, and you're giving the team the tactical understanding of the game, are you every player in that again will go on then, Mick, what about me within this? How does this help me in this game? You know, how does this promote me? How do I get on the ball? Because that's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of the individual. So you need to go around and you need to make sure this fits everybody. Or do you just go in with a blanket tactic that's not um, that's not set for the players that you have. It's just your ideals without taking in consideration the players you had. So the question about football, about it's wider than the foundation phase. It's a big, massive thing, but it starts there. It starts there. And if you don't get that base right, then you're failing them kids. And if you treat every kid like he's your own son, and you can hear I'm quite passionate on it. I'll rant about it a bit, but it's a passion of mine, this foundation phase. And as I say, that was the best year I had at Liverpool. I thought the staff there were magnificent. And I thought we saw huge gains in about five or six months in our players. Like we had a lefty club. So we had a certain amount of lefties in the foundation. And they were doing, obviously, it was quite a pride thing. Oh, with the lefties, we stick together and we do a little bit of extra work on our right foot to add to what we do on our left. And it was like, we're unique, we're the lefties. And we had little things like that. And we had, you know, we had lots and lots of ball mastery. And it was, uh, I have to say, I enjoyed that year more than anything else I've done in football. Right, so a couple of points I want to pick up on because it's really interesting. The first point you made about that, you know, it's not a circus. I think that's a really important point because I think there's a cultural problem, isn't there? Some information gap where people think, oh, you've got your skillful type players that can only produce it in the playground or, you know, develop it there. But it's, it's so, so wrong, isn't it? You know you, can, you know, you can develop players like this. All players should have 1v1 capabilities, outplaying capabilities. You know, whether it doesn't always look like a Jaden Sancho, do you know what I mean? It might look like a Harry Winks, like a little, just a movement to cuck inside. So one is that it's that, 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 that may be that information gap. And then two, just, uh, Ari, I'll come back to you about that first one. I just want to ask Mickey to follow up about this one. What did you what did you think? You mentioned there Brazil, coming back from Brazil and bringing something back with it. What did you mean by that? Did you, was it, was it just the technical, individual technical excellence of the players and like that, you know, that, that individual brilliance that's, that you noticed them all having and you want to try and replicate that in the academy? Well, there's a few things, mate. The first thing is like that, Technique is a given. It's a pride thing, but that doesn't mean they're all fantastic players. Because so they, you know, they have to link that technique to their identity and to a decision on the pitch in the game. So we can't lose that part. You know, the element of applied technique rather than just having technique. And we'll have all worked with young players that have been through a skills program where they've got every trick in the book, but they don't know how to put it together. We call them all or nothings, don't we? So they've got everything, they don't know how to use it. So that was a big thing about being in Brazil. Not all Brazilian players are brilliant. The best ones are, but there's a layer underneath that. They're technically very good, but they can't put it all together. So identity was a big thing like to teach young players, what are you and how do you apply it within the game? That was, that was huge. And the other thing is, is like, culture so i went to live in brazil and south america and the way they talk and see and listen about the game is different to how we do in britain and they're very expressive and they want time to explore and they want time in after training to have on their own they don't want the coach around they want to practice and explore and and the big thing for them is it's all about scoring goals so everything you do is about playing forward 
or being able to run forward or being able to outplay someone to go forward. And just to echo you there, everyone outplays in different ways. Like you just use Harry Winks there. He outplays with his ability to move to receive. He's scanning before receiving. His ability to to see the pass as it comes, he can play around the corner and move and get it back or to take it on his back foot to take it between two players and, and change the, the, the switch to play. Jaden's very different. Jaden's all about the 1v1 and outplaying you by running off the ball or with the ball or playing in combination with someone. So each player's unique. A young John Terry would have been unique in how he outplayed because he'd have outplayed you with his defensive skills and his, his, his game craft and his knowledge. So when I was out in Brazil and I was in isolation away from my family and only going to work, this gave me a big time of like, uh, of like to, to think and reflect on youth development and player development. So I came back with a lot of energy is what I'm trying to put across and, and a lot, lot of clarity because obviously you go somewhere else in the world and a lot of things you're doing, they're promoting as well. And, and so you come back with clarity and a few more ideas. So, you know, when, when Alex invited me to go back to Liverpool, you know, to go and work again with six to nine year olds or six to 11 year olds and the coaches, I wasn't sure, but once I got started, it was it was a magnificent year, and it's actually disappointing I've moved away from it in some ways. And H, what do you think about the uh, the, the previous point about that about maybe a bit of a cultural misunderstanding about developing one v one in uh, the foundation, and it can be done in a in a structured environment. Yeah, I think it can. I think um, I think probably just within our culture, we would look at players who would be really competent at travelling with the ball taking the ball and going past players and just automatically label them with the word greedy, which, you know, I, I think we're coming away from that a little bit. Um, I think it is, I, I would say, so I do think it's changing. I do think it's changing. I'm, I'm still in and around it. I see some really good work going on. Um, so I don't want people to listen to this podcast and think, we're, you know, that we're just, you know, bashing people because there's some fantastic work going on. I, I just think, again, on your point that you made about Potentially having a foundation phase head of coaching, I'm not sure how that would how that would make your foundation lead feel, or would that be your foundation lead? That would just be more about relationship management for me and trust. So your head of coaching across the academy would just have that trust that the person that's taking charge of your your eights to elevens or your nines to elevens or whatever bracket it's in has got that knowledge and that knowledge base and that understanding of what it takes to produce a player for the next phase. And for me personally, that's a real big thing that this, this, this within my ethos is produce a player for the next phase. Yes, we have to think about the end game. I do get that. But produce a player for the next phase and the next phase and the next phase. I don't think you can go wrong. Um, but I do think that it is changing. I don't think that it's just a case of we're saying to everyone that dribbles with the ball and players that are 1v1 artists that know, you know, that that. You know, he's a cage player and things like that. I hate, I hate things like that. I think we're embracing it a little bit more because if you're looking at the players that are coming through at the moment through the system, a lot of the players that we're producing are, are, are competent in most of these areas and they're exciting to watch. And I think over the next 10, 15 years, we're going to see more of that because I think we've got it right across the country with, yes, some of the grassroots stuff coming into the academy stuff and then the academy stuff going into the pro phases, we're starting to get it right more than we more than we are not. Decent, mate. So, okay, let's get the next question. I know we, we, we guys are busy. I don't want to take too much of your time. We're going to come towards the end. Of it. So, there's another question. Uh, in a post-Klopp and Guardiola um, era, where do you see the next trends in elite football heading and how will academies develop alongside these trends? What's already changed in the academies more recently? You'd like to go first with that one. Well, no, go, mate. go on, I Mickey. Think, uh, I think, you know, the, the post-clock Guardiola era, it could be for the next 10 years. Them two ain't going anywhere anytime soon by the looks of it. They're, <laughs> they're enjoying their role. Uh, it's so great to see two different, completely different types of managers as well. They're obviously big, huge personalities. One's based, you know, from, you know, he's based his whole thing on the purity of football and then the other manager is very much on the emotion and the human aspects. And it's making for fantastic, you know, obviously last year, Man City won everything. This year, until we're in this period now, Liverpool were, were as good as any team we've ever seen in the Premier League era. So if I just talk about football in general, I think there's a change in, there's less big, strong, uh, direct number nines. There's more hybrid forwards. So if you look at the moment, the best or the top goal scorers in world football, your Ronaldo, your Messi's, your Mohamed Salahs and Mane in the Premier League, your Raheem Sterling, 
they're like hybrid forwards. They're actually arriving at the number nine position from out wide. So I think the the the, the position the, the position of number nine's changing and it's more it's more fluid, there's more movement, there's less direct number nine. That has a direct effect on centre centre backs. And if you look at the size and of centre backs now, they're less six foot four. Uh, I know the best one in the league is Van Dijk, but in general, if you look at centre backs, they're getting smaller and more agile, especially at Champions League level. When you look at Mascherano, and recently I've been watching Emre Chan play there for Germany as well, so that gives you an idea that it's changing. So I think positions you're having less positional specialists in terms of like a profile. So a centre four being six foot a centre-half being six foot, six foot two. I think what you're finding now is everyone has the profile of like a 400-metre runner and everyone's a really good all-rounder. There used to be a great saying from Real Madrid a few years back that we have two centre-backs, a goalie, a number nine, and then we have six football or seven football players. And I think that's even that's expanding now. I think everybody is a lot more hybrid in a lot of the things they need to do in terms of receiving, in terms of the... The ability to to twist and turn and to run, um, I think the game's evolving all the time, and I think it's only going to get more technical, more physical decisions under more pressure at more speed. So that's the big thing I think is now you're not going to have players where you go, oh, he's going to be a centre back because he's that size, or he's going to be a centre forward, or he's going to be this. I think now uh, there's a lot more hybrid positions on the pitch due to rotations. And H, what do you think? Future game, I think I do think he's going to be quicker. I think we're exposing players to the physical, the physical corner itself. We've got specialists that are helping players move better, so I think it will be quicker. I think you're going to have to be technically better again, down to stuff that we're exposing them to, which would equal your intelligence levels are going to have to go up, your speed of thought are going to have to go up. So I do still think you are going to see a Matt Letizia come through, but imagine Matt Letizia coming through that could move a little bit better. So I think you're going to see you're going to see things like that going on to the, the profiles of positions. I do think that the, the the profiles are broadening. I think he's getting bigger. So if you're looking at one to eleven all the way through the team, the profile of a fullback is completely changing. We've gone from you know you having a a centre half that was too small gets chucked into being a fullback, or a fouled winger is a fullback. So now you're looking at someone like Trent Alexander Arnold, who's got all the technical capabilities to play in the middle of the pitch. Um, you're looking at your centre half and you're saying they need to be able to take the ball under extreme pressure because of the style. Midfielders are looking different. Forwards, you are still having a few old school target nines, um, but then you're looking at your Agueros and your players like that and you're saying they're different. I think the wide players are changing. You've got a variety. You've got old school wingers that will go down the line and cross it, but they're, they're, they're not so few and far between anymore. Then you've got your wide tens, like your Hazards, who are really good at picking up pockets and playing in there. And then what I think you'll find, probably just touching on what Mick says, is those position profiles and those position specifics, we're starting to probably add more things on the list of what you might need to be able to do to get into teams going forward. So just to, just to wrap that, it, I think it'll be quicker. I think they'll be technically elite. I think they'll be more intelligent. And I also think there'll be more use of the analytical side of the game. I'm seeing some top coaches now importing big screens into their training ground and stopping sessions live and rehearsing the things that they're seeing. I think people are taking advantage of of technology. They're taking advantage of the specialists that we have. So sports scientists, uh, everything like that. So I do think the game, if you're looking at the game in 20 years' time, I think it will look... A hell of a lot more exciting and quicker and really good to watch. It's interesting, isn't it? I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. Uh, you look at Liverpool and the way they set up, and I mean, he's he really has changed, you know, convention there. He's gone against, obviously, you, know, you look at the midfielders there, maybe not a natural number 10 in any position, but very much, you know, physically, uh, a lot of cap- capabilities, you know, Milner and Henderson and those players who can really press and run a lot. And then you've got almost a nine playing as a 10 and then a two wide forwards almost as just forward players really change the nature so from my perspective as an individual coach I look for players that play at the highest level because you mentioned Trent Alexander it's really interesting isn't it because he's almost changed changed the nature of you know as a fullback in terms of his delivery now as that weapon is so strong you know you've got to add that so it's interesting isn't it and then you look at Guardiola 
and he's playing with several number 10s all around there and you know much maybe you know not as many runners in there it's interesting to look at those individual capabilities so the question going back to the question where I'm going I suppose in a very long way around the, around the hours is, is how does that affect us then as, as youth developers you know if we're looking at our 9s and 10s 11s are we thinking okay look that's the that's what the game at the highest level looks like are we recruiting then like looking for that are we trying to you know then get that those those looking for those 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 uh, qualities and players at that young age what do you reckon I mickey the, yeah i think one thing to to, uh, to say is that if we look at the players that are coming through now through our academies we have to smile and we have to smile and realize that we're doing a lot of things right and the players are not all coming from one club they're coming from various clubs and the other thing that i think super exciting is that the foreign clubs are valuing the english players they never used to they never used to rate our players. You know, the Dutch clubs wouldn't buy an English player. The, the Italians wouldn't. The, the French wouldn't. The Germans wouldn't. And now, all of a sudden, our players, our young, young players, are getting selected by them clubs and they're going out and having other experiences and learning second languages. So we're growing. Just like all the foreign nations have before, we're growing and we're adding, you know, these elements of different culture and different ways of playing the game in. So we must be doing some good work in our academies. And when I see that, you know, Jaden Sancho was 20 this week and what he's doing at Dortmund for a young English player is incredible. And we've got other players who are playing in the Premier League and doing really well. And, and the exact type of players that we're looking for, you know, is Rashford a number nine or is he a wide player? Or could he drop off and play as a 10? Well, he's trying all of them things. And at his age, he's doing fantastically well. And, and, you know, you, you, you look at this now. Mason Mount's playing as a 10 for Chelsea, but I actually think he's an 8, and I think he can play as a 6. And it's fantastic. You see young Billy Gilmore playing for them that obviously was developed at Rangers and moved down. And it's not you don't have to be 5 foot 11 or 6 foot 1 no more to play in the Premier League. You have to be able to hold the ball, receive it. You have to be able to interact with people. You need to be able to get around. So I do think we are producing a player where other countries are going, wow, what are they doing in England? So although we're doing this podcast like we always should do, because it's not about how good we are, it's whether we're getting better. And I think that's what we've got to keep doing. We have to keep making players more robust, more technically um, efficient, more technically smooth. Uh, their awareness, improved decision-making all the time, improve the speed of decision-making. So I think we need to keep evolving. But I think the other thing as well is for the first time in many years, I actually think we're in a good, quite a good place. We must be doing good stuff in our clubs. And if you've ever seen a boy come out of Arsenal's academy before and you watch him work, you go, he's from Arsenal. And if I see a player from Tottenham now, I'm working at first team level, and we're, we're looking at some players, I go, oh, he's a Tottenham player because I can see what they've been doing. And it'd be the same with Liverpool. So we're starting to get somewhere in terms of our academies and what we're producing. I don't think we're the finished article by any stretch. I look at, I look at France, for example, and they're exciting, really exciting the Germans are having a go again, and I, and I predict the Germans will take a lot of stopping in the next Euros. But as a country ourselves, we're in quite a good place. And I, we also have a national team coach that's very interesting because he gives the young players a go. And we've just appointed John McDermott to, to manage the younger international team. So I expect us to see some improvement there as well in terms of you know, pushing this work within our national association, which is very important. H, what's your thoughts? I completely agree with I completely agree with everything that Mick said. I think um, I do think it's exciting. I do I do think that there are players coming through. I know there are players coming through, and I think probably for the first time in quite a while, we're we're not necessarily always constantly looking over our shoulder and saying, "Oh, what are the Germans doing?" and let's copy that. And what are the Spanish doing? And let's copy that. We're you know we're being really good. We've been really good thieves over the years, but now we're harnessing what's worked for us. And, and making it happen and I think going back to the, the point you made about Firmino if you strip that right back and you said you know what he does really well he's almost like a nine and a half so wasn't he he's not really a nine he's not really a ten but what he does really well he plays one v two and occupies two centre halves and normally drags one into the pitch with him to allow one of the wide players to drift inside and run beyond but that's stripping it all the way back to what we've been talking about at the start. And that's receiving 1v1 with pressure from behind you to either link or twist and turn and get front facing and then run beyond. So it's about manipulating yourself, manipulating the ball and then manipulating your opponent 
to get the to get the end outcome. And it, it once you strip those back, those things back that we've spoken about for the entire podcast, it goes back again to those those uh, those relationship managements. What we said about you and the ball, you and your mate, and you and your your opponent, and then it goes all the way to the top level. Okay, interesting. I said before we go, there's a few like quick fire questions that people sent in again. So. Um... Uh, under nines, what's your favourite seven v seven formation? Mickey, you got one of them. <laughs> one sip. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just kills what we've been talking about. Yeah, but no, yeah. this, when I played it, two three one, three two one, but ultimately one back and the best guy and score a goal. Harry, I used to like playing the best dribbler in the ever shape we had um, when I was at Chelsea because they. They had more opportunities to go and beat more players, but no, I agree. It it, um, it throws it throws it back up in the air about what we've been talking about, really. What, what yeah. about so Jim, Go on, go on, Mickey. I mean, when I was coaching them age groups, right, we we had a guy Bob Osborne that we all worked with at Chelsea, and he, you know, pull your air out because he was a, you working with a genius in his own way or a maverick, and you wouldn't always agree with what he did, but he rotated who played where and everything like that. He did all the right things and. I used to say, like, you know, the, the defenders have gone on holiday to under 12s. And the parents and the kids would look. And I would say, well, look, who's going to touch the ball the most? When our goalie gets it, who's he giving it to? It's the guy at the back. And then you get to dribble the most because you get the longest amount of space in front of you to dribble. Um, so we, you have to be creative in it. And I think that, you know, it, it's more it's, it's mindful that the people at the back of the pitch are probably touching the ball the most. What about formations then, generally, Mickey? I'll start you. Then if you were... Uh... You know, if you're an academy manager, would you have a, you know, a, a single formation or a couple of formations for the academy, or would it just be dependent yeah, on I the think, game? I would you, would you... Clarity of role, and I think clarity of like, you know, relationships on the pitch and space is very beneficial. I think the, I think when you're defending, I think formations are more important than when you're, you're attacking. I think when you're attacking, it's all about what areas you want to occupy. So I think obviously, you know, with, with, with offside rules, as you get to 11 v 11, the other team can sort of manipulate the length of the game. And, you, and so the game's always played within about 40 yards in length or 45 yards in length because of offside. But, you, can, you know, you've always got width. So I think width's really important. Um, and I think it, it doesn't matter. You, have, you know, you have two centre defenders or you have one because you've got two wide centre defenders in the back three that are going to step in and you have someone up front. So that's the length in your pitch. And then it's about having width and it's whether you want one on each side and then lots of rotation in the middle or <laughs> you want two on each side with a little bit less rotation. I think them things are, when, you, it, when you've got the ball, I think it's about occupying areas to hurt the opponents between their formation or outside their formation it's all about breaking the last line I think when you're defending that's when you want to see your formation H what do you reckon yeah I, I, it's probably the best probably my favourite question you've asked that one I think I think if I was an academy manager tomorrow I would want probably from a certain age maybe 14 and above I'd want us to just look at relationship management so play systems in blocks where you're looking at playing on your own playing in a pair and playing as a three so within one of the blocks, I'd like to see a centre forward playing with a partner next to him because I do think that we've lost we've lost that uh, that that one running off, that one running behind, and that one linking in, which again does affect the types of defenders you will produce. Because I think a lot of our defenders are fantastic when it's in front of them, but when they've got an emergency defender and face their own goal, they're not getting enough real sparring at that. I think midfield players, if you can produce midfield players that can play in a two and just half the pitch themselves, ideally they'll be able to play in a three. So again, that's I think they need to be exposed to having two in midfield and three in midfield, a closed triangle and an open triangle. And then a back three is really interesting for me because playing as an outside centre-half has got different permutations and different, different strains it may put on you as a player. Playing as a two as well is completely different. Also, the pitch of the goalkeeper sees. We don't talk about goalkeepers a lot, but that affects the service lines for the goalkeeper. So I would say in short, I'd like to see blocks of systems where you, you've got a three at the back, you've got two centre-halves at the back, you've got a three in midfield, you've got two centre midfielders, and you've got partnerships up front and threes, a narrow three, a wide three. And I think that would help us expose players to a little bit more and help them in terms of their relationship management because just to close on what Mickey said I agree when you've got the ball 
ideally you want to be out of position to, to try and confuse the opposition. So then it's about your relationship management, how you talk, how you move, when you move, what you do, when your actions are. And, and, and your systems mainly will come into place at times when you don't have the ball and, and how you interact uh, and organise. Last question. This is one uh, a kind of manager recently said to me that he thought the uh, youth development pr- um, process in England was a bit like throwing a, a box of eggs against the wall and hoping one sticks. Do you think... Um, do you think have we got it right in this country? With you talk about you know we have we have got some of the best young players, if not you know the best crop of young players in world football. Do you think we got it right, and, and where do you think we could we could maybe get a little bit better? What do you reckon, Mickey? We're on the right, I think we're on the right um, right roads. But I can only talk about the clubs that I've worked at. Obviously, you know Chelsea, Liverpool, and Rangers, and all of them academies are very very good academies in their own way. I think they all buy into the culture of the players that are in their area, which I think is important. And that's the lovely, that's the variety of of the academy football as you move up and down the country. And I think that's important that, you know, the culture of the local area comes into the work you do in the academy. It's so brilliant to see the young players getting up exposure at Chelsea now, which I think is fantastic for them. Liverpool have a rich history in it and it's ingrained in the area and they have a real set way in terms of how they develop in their academy, the individual which I think is great. I mean, in the period I've seen here at Rangers, that you know we have 15 players in the 19s, 21s of Scotland squads, and obviously other countries as well. But you know, 15 boys there, which I think is fantastic. So I do think we're on the way. I slightly disagree because it's a generalised comment. The guy, the comment the guy made to, he's obviously generalising. What I would say, it's like bringing up your own children. You know, just make sure when you shut the door at night before you start telling everybody else how to bring theirs up. Make sure you're making a good job of it at home. So I think that when, when you're back within your own club, you know, if you've got an opinion and you're passionate about youth development, make sure that you, you say it and you don't just sit there in that nice job for as long as possible, taking your wages and, and letting the dreams and hopes and goals of young kids pass by. I think it's really important if you're working with young people that you treat them like they're your son and you really try to help them on their journey really help them so that means is, is it your game or theirs at the weekend so at the weekend it's their game so allow it to be their game and make I, I, it about go on, mate sorry go on. no make it about players I think it's so important that you make everything you do about the player and that's the essence of youth development that you're or development that it's about the other person it's not about you and I think that if you do that uh, word of mouth will go round you'll get a fantastic reputation players will grow and 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 with you on their journey, they'll speak well of you. And you'll get where you're going. You'll get where you're going. But make sure you, you're helping, really helping the young players as a guide. Yeah, I think maybe he's alluding more to the fact about, well, particularly about, you know, our, our talent ID at such a young age, you know, getting seven and eight year olds in. And maybe can we really tell at that age, you know, what we what are you recruiting their talent or potential? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that movement mechanics are something that you see in, in just people in life in general. And, you know, we've all been there. We've seen 100 kids run on AstroTurf and we've seen the different movement mechanics. I remember seeing Ruben Loftus-Cheek as a six, seven-year-old and thought, wow, all of the ball manipulation stuff and technical work we're going to do with this boy is going to stick because his movement mechanics are fantastic. So, you know, you start going, as a boy gets to 13, 14, you can start saying, well, is he going to foul technically? Is he going to foul physically? Is it his mentality? What is it? And you start helping that kid with it. But I, I would still say at a young age, if you put a load of young kids with the ball and they move around, the movement mechanics go a long way to helping you be an athlete. And then once you, you know, once you're an athlete, it's whether then you can apply decision making and you can gain technique. But I think certainly the way the game's going now, it's hard to be a player. It's hard, very difficult or nigh on impossible to be a player if you're not a good athlete. H, what do you reckon? I'd have to disagree with the statement. Just, I think I do think it's a generalisation. I would I would then question what you. Someone was saying that to me. I'd say, well, what is your plan? If you, it sounds like you don't necessarily have a plan or have that potentially that experience of having pushed people through beforehand. I think. We're so lucky in England. We've got an unbelievable plethora of talent that are coming through from different areas, different backgrounds, and different types of people sparring against each other day in and day out, highlighting strengths and weaknesses and getting the best out of each other. I think going to onto your point, Saul, just about the recruitment side from 
you know, young players at a young age. You've got to be, you've got to be mindful of what their football age is. You know, are you looking at an eight-year-old that's had a thousand one-to-one sessions since he's been three years old? Are you looking at an eight-year-old that's literally just come off of the park and, you know, just plays with his mates? You've, you've then got to have. I do think you've got to have an eye. Um, and, I, and I can say this, and I hope you don't mind. M- Mickey, when he was, you know, managing me at Chelsea, would be able to spot a player and say, "I think, I think he's got something." So you've got to have that, um, and then you've got to have the plan in place to push those players through. So, just as a generalised statement, I would disagree. And I think if you trust yourself and you trust the process, you will get players through. You do also. Unfortunately, you've got to be lucky because. Your first team manager when, when the kid's eight and nine is, is very, very rarely going to be the first team manager when he's 19, 20, 21. So it's important that the, the whole ethos of the club doesn't change too much. And it's about producing players to be able to cope in any environment the first team manager puts on them. And last one, I promise. Last, just um, when did you think a player should start playing football? I mean, Tom Byer, who's a, I don't know if you guys know him, a friend of the show, a friend of mine, speak to him a lot. He's really big on this football starts at home thing about you know almost the one till six phase and how important that is. And actually, the more I listen to him, the more I reflect how important that is. Being an academy coach, as you said, H, about players coming, what's their football age? But we all know, you know, how players having that head start when they've got that ball manipulation at a young age. What would your advice be to parents in terms of what age should players start pe- playing? Age, what's your age going? I think, I think, I think the kids need to find football themselves, and that's just me being completely honest. I think they need to. I used to go to bed with a football indoors when I was seven or eight. I used to love the game. I still love the game now, but I think that, that they need to find the game themselves. I also think when you're talking about playing, and we spoke about it right at the top of the show. And I said the word play. I used to play out all the time and I would play, I'd I'd be 10, 11 years old. I'd be playing against 15, 16 year olds and I'd have to learn how to get out of the way and use my body and use their weight. And I'd be playing against smaller players and trying to be nimble and move my feet, not to to kind of crush them. So I I think the early, listen, obviously the earlier you can pick it up would would suggest that, you know, potentially the better you're going to be. But I would say let them find the game first. Nick? There's a difference between playing and training, isn't there? Do you know what I mean? So I think like you know, like I've got a young boy who's six and he's a little bit obsessive. I won't, I won't do anything with him. My wife's driving me mad about it. You know, in terms of why won't you do stuff? I just want him to play. There'll be a moment when he's ready for training where he'll say, "Dad, can I work? Could you teach me this or teach me that?" But at the moment, he's very much in the play stage where I want him to love it. You know, there's a load of stats and data out there. It was my job at one stage to know all these, you know, about with, with single parents and when you're born and whether you've had older brothers or whether you live on council estates where there's natural play and that around you and challenge around you. You know, with all them stats, you know, I used to really, you know, believe in a lot of them things. I used to look at them when we were recruiting players and try to get the background. But what I've come down to is any data that isolates or, or takes or... or sort of exclude someone is wrong data. So I think the football has come from all different walks and stuff like that. And I just think that there's a difference between play. I think kids could be playing anything in terms of sports at a young age. You know, like that's up to the each household. So, if, you know, some babies just take to things and others don't. And when they're three and four and it comes on. And I think training is different. I think we've got to be really careful with training because there's a lot of confused coaches out there. I think play... They can play as much as they like. Just keep playing and playing and exploring. And just just before we finish, I want to go back to that last one about recruitment because it's really important. Like when we was at Chelsea and there was all the scouts in that development program, you know, successful. And I remember something that I used to echo to everyone at the time is about young players that you were all working with. It was like, tell me something that excites you about that kid. You want us to push him on, whether it gets to the next stage or gets signed or whatever. You have to be able to tell me something that excites you about that kid because when you watch loads of young kids play football, there's lots of good players. But what excites you? What's going to give you energy to go on that journey with that kid or for us as a club too? And I think that's really important for anyone working with young players. Find something that excites you about them. Make sure that kid knows that that's, that that's what you see in them and then really use that to develop them over the coming years. Mickey, H, thanks very much, guys. It's been first class. So, here's my...
Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.